We'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. Ephesians 1 and verse 10. Just reading into the uh, passage of Scripture. Just remind ourselves of context because we're almost we're getting in the trees and we begin to lose the whole forest. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of his glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us a mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, a summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven, and things on the earth. <clears throat> the Bible is a revelation of God. It tells us who God is, and it tells us what his plan is, and it reveals to us redemption for we who are lost in our sin. And for it's important for God that he tell us his plan, and it's important that we know his plan. And in verse 10 of this chapter, he is reminding us of the wisdom and insight that he gave us in earlier verses with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of times. Let's just take a look at that phrase because it tells us of the summation of the ages. Paul picks up the thought from a previous verse where he said he made known to us the mystery of his will. And just a reminder, a mystery is not something mysterious in the Bible. It is something that was unknown. It was truth unknown, but revealed in the progress of revelation. So God has revealed his wisdom and insight into the plan of the ages which he designed for his children. And God continues to unfold that thought by what he purposed or literally set before him in Christ. In the previous verse, it says he purposed in Christ. Literally, that verse is like setting a meal before someone. He set a meal. He set this purpose for us for we would know. The governing word in this phrase with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times is the word times. It is a word that kind of is the umbrella over this entire phrase. And notice that it's not singular, it's plural. He says, the fullness of the times. This is an important thing. So what is God purposing in Christ? What is he doing? God is purposing to unite all things in Christ under Christ's sovereign rule and control. And when will this happen? It will happen at the time of the administration of the fullness of time when there is a this administration comes it has not yet come it will happen when Christ comes back again let's take a work a look at the word administration the word administration in some versions is translated dispensation it is a word which means uh, it has two sides it has an administration in which it is a position of an administrator or we might use it as a manager. And there are certain administrations under the managers. It is, a, it is the activity of administrating. 
It would be like uh, uh, a section of time where someone is administering a certain flow, a certain administration. The word uh, occurs three times in the book of Ephesians. Once here, take a look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2. It occurs again. He says, I'll pick it up at verse 1 of Ephesians 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which he was given to me for you. Here the word stewardship is the same word as dispensation or administration in our verse 10 of chapter 1. Chapter 3, verse 9, it is used again. And he says, to bring to light what is the administration of this mystery, which for the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. In chapter 3, verse 2, Paul had an administration of God's grace. It was up to him as an apostle to speak and to teach of the grace of God, which we, era we are now living. Verse 9, he explains, to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which in ages past was hidden by God, who created all things. Now, Paul uses this elsewhere. Uh, I'm spending a little bit of time on this because we have a, a real controversy within the evangelical church these days. We have what we call dispensational theology, and we have covenant theology. And uh, there is a difference. And to have covenant theology, it's all based on covenants, a couple which are not even in the Bible, but which are held to very high esteem among covenant people. And that is the covenant of grace that God worked out and the covenant of works. In, in dispensational theology, we have covenants. We have covenants that are clearly spelled out in the Word of God. We have the covenant with Noah. It will not, the world will not flood again, even if we get two inches this week and the plat goes out of its banks, there will never be a worldwide flood again. And what's the sign of that covenant? Rainbow. Rainbow. God made another covenant, and he made a covenant with Abraham. In chapter 12, 15, and 17, he made a covenant with Abraham that Abraham would be the father of a great nation. And what's the sign of that covenant? Circumcision. God gave the sign to Abraham that his children would be blessed, and out of Abraham would come kings and the nation of Israel. Then God made a covenant with Moses called the Palestinian covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and a land covenant, and God gave the law on Mount Sinai and a covenant with the children of Israel. And then God gave him another covenant, and the covenant in, in that case would be the covenant with David. And the covenant with David was basically that out of David's loins, a king would rule forever the Messiah. Now the children of Israel could not keep the law, never could keep the law, so in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, God made another covenant called the New Covenant, a nation with Israel in which he would take the external law and put the internal law within the heart. So God made these covenants. But we also read that there are, as we are told in, Revel in a Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, that there is an administration that is going on today that was held not known. It was a mystery to those of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament. Now, Paul uses this word elsewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17. Let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians 9, 17. For if I do this voluntary... I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me, it's the same word, administration, 
dispensation trusted to me. He has a management trusted to me. Then you go to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 25. It's used again. And it's used in this sense. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God. There's our word again. Stewardship from God bestowed on me for your behalf so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. I have an administration, I have a stewardship given to me to preach the gospel to you. In 1 Timothy, we have Paul using the word again. Nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than the furthering the administration of God, which is given by faith. Here's our word again. Administration of God, which is by faith. The only other New Testament writer who uses this word is Luke. And he uses it strictly as a manager. Luke chapter 16, verses 2 to 4. Luke 16, verses 2 to 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 16, 2 to 4. This is a case of the unfaithful manager, the unfaithful steward. And he called him and he said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, our word, for that you can no longer be manager, a form of that word. The manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the administration from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do when I am removed from, here's our word, the management. Uh, people will welcome me into their house. So the word is a, a, a management, a stewardship. And God has various stewardships in the ages of time. Now, the word time is interesting here. There are two words for time in the Bible. One is chronos, from which we get chronology. And that is a period of time. The other is kairos, which is a more critical time, a short time, an important time. Now, when you study the Bible, you've got to be careful here about words. Sometimes people get a word and it has to mean the same thing every place it comes up. Words are determined by its context. The context determines the meaning of a word. It may mean one thing here and it may mean something slightly over here, even as you've seen in stewardship. Stewardship can mean either the activity of management or it can mean the period of management or the quantity of management. Time can be, chronos and kairos, can you be used on occasions synonymously. However, here the word is kairos, and it speaks of a specific or a particular point of history. It has a similar usage in Galatians 4.4. We use this verse at Christmas. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. At a specific time in history, this was foreordained, this was predicted at the right time, Jesus Christ came to be born in Bethlehem and to be incarnate. The fullness of time connotes completeness, entirety, as well. Now we showed you that it's really fullness of times. Now Paul relates there will be a future administration or dispensation in which all things will be brought together in Christ or under Christ's rule in the fullness of times. It's not difficult when you go back through the Bible to identify the economies the administrations, or the dispensations in biblical history. We can all do that very easily. For example, creation to the fall. 
When you look at creation to the fall, it was entirely different. They didn't have any law whatsoever. There were no commandments there. So what was the rule? What, what ruled that particular age? What ruled that particular stage? Well, there's an inner control center in man called the conscience. The conscience is that good angel in you, so to speak, that goodness in you that reminds you when you did something wrong. But a conscience can be seared. A conscience can be controlled. And by the time you get over 1,670 years, God destroyed the entire world by what? Water. It was so bad and so corrupt that God had to destroy the whole thing. Kind of reminder to us, isn't it, as Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah? Are we coming there? I just was listening to a message this past week or a question and answer period last week and one of the men was speaking there, was, spe was from Scotland and he said that you think it's bad here, Scotland is 50 to 60 years ahead of us in sin. They don't even write on the birth certificate whether it's a male or female, they wait for five years or six years to decide that. That's where we're coming. And somebody reminded me on Wednesday night that even the Merkel, this new couple in England, they're going to not write down whether the baby's a, that there's due is going to be male or female. They're going to wait for five years and let it decide for itself. That's where we are, people, as it was in the days of Noah. Well, God destroyed the world. He's not going to destroy the world again by water, but by what? Fire. Fire. Somebody's been to Sunday school. Fire. So after the flood, there was another economy, the fall of Adam, or I should say <coughs> from the, uh, so the creation, let me go over it again. Creation to the fall was perfect. God walked with uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. From the fall of Adam to the, to the flood of Noah, it seemed to be the inner control center of man, the conscience. From the flood, to no from the flood of Noah to the tower of Babel, there was a form of government in that human life was sanctioned. In chapter 9, verse 6 of Genesis, God said, if someone takes a human life, then society has a right to take their life. Capital punishment. Society started to rule. It ended up in the Tower of Babel. God had to separate the entire world government by bringing in languages, and bringing in languages brought in a nationalistic spirit. People could not understand each other, so they scattered through all the earth, which God told them to do anyway after the flood. So now we have families and nationalism. After the Tower of Babel, God called the family of Abraham and gave Abraham some promises. No law, promises. I will give your children this. I will give you this land. I will be with your children, and this land is your land forever. Well, that era ended up how? In Egypt. They ended up in Egypt, of all things. How long were they in Egypt? 400 years. Think of that. In 2619, 400 years ago, it would be 1619. How long ago was that? That's a long time. Then God gave them, after the Exodus, the law of Moses to the crucifixion of Christ. He gave the Ten Commandments, not just the Ten Commandments. He gave them the whole law. Some people want to divide the Ten Commandments into the law, the civil, and the religious. 
There's no such thing in the Bible. There's no try thing in the Bible. It's the law, all of it. It's not separated. He gave them the law. What happened to the law? The law became so diluted that they had their own law at the time of Christ. And they were self-righteous as a nation. And they who had the perfect law crucified the only one who kept it. From the crucifixion of Christ, we go to from the day of Pentecost after the crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection and ascension, we go from the day of Pentecost till Christ returns to the church. That's us. We're not under the law. We are under grace. We have freedom. And we have liberty. And we're warned not to go back into legalism, and we're warned not to go into licentiousness. This is the administration of this age. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Every person born again in this age receives the Holy Spirit living within him, sealed by the Spirit at the moment he breathes out faith in Christ. That's our age. If you're born again, you have it living within you, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Just to be, uh, keep the word straight, that's why I don't like the word sanctuary here. This room is no more holy and no more sanctuous, what should I say, a sanctimonious than the gathering place. The only reason we don't let you drink coffee or we don't want you to drink coffee in here is we like to keep it clean. That's the only reason we don't want to be legalistic about it, but it just looks nice. And the gathering place, drink your coffee and, and spill it and we'll pay every now and then somebody come in and really clean the floor and get all the stains out. But the point, of course, is every room in this church, no, none of the rooms are more holy than any other place. This building is not more holy than any other building. You're the sanctuary. And when we're gathered together, we are the collection of the saints. When you drive by this building, this is nothing more than a church building that houses the saints. The church the country Bible, <clears throat> country Bible, what is the name of our church? Countryside Bible Church <laughs> is everywhere. Well, you drive by here tomorrow morning if you do. You want to know where the church is? It's from Grand Island to Waco, from Geneva to Marquette. That's where the church is, to Stromsburg. We'll leave them out. It's all over. That's the church. And we ought to be witnessing of our, the glory of God. We gather to be edified. We scatter to evangelize. The purpose of the church is not to bring the unsaved in. We're glad when they come. And when they come in, according to 1 Corinthians 14, when they come in, they sense God is here, and they realize the need to put their faith and trust in Christ. But the real evangelism is when from Monday from when you leave this building to when you come in. That's where you talk about Christ. That's where you live your life. That's where you have your impact. You come here to be strengthened and you leave to evangelize. So we don't call this the sanctuary. But there is an age coming. From the 70th week of Daniel after Christ comes for the church... There is a new era ushered in back to Israel. And that's where Christ will rule and bring all things back to himself. Notice what Paul calls, or the Bible calls, this age. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11 we read, Now these things happen to them, that's Israel, as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We're the, end, we're the last of the ages in many, many ways. 
Not the fullness of time, but the end of the ages. 1 John 2, 16, children, it is the last hour. Just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know it is the last hour. We have a lot of Antichrists going, carrying on a ministry in this age. They're not the Antichrist. They are an Antichrist in the sense they deny Christ. They deny the deity of Christ. They are already setting the stage for the Antichrist. And boy, is that happening. Denomination and churches, one after another, is falling away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, and many have already fallen, and they're ready to accept the Antichrist. Hebrews 1, 2. In these last days... <coughs> He has in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. So these ages have come. The next phrase is that is the summing up of all things in Christ. The construction of this last phrase is in a aorist middle infinitive, which means it is a summing up. It is, it is giving us this instruction for our benefit. The verb means to gather together, to unite, to, to gather together up all things in Christ. Notice the word gathered is used in Romans 13, 9. You remember this verse. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and if there's any other commandment, it is summed up. Here's our word. It is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul is saying that this administration suitable to the fullness of times will be summed up of all things in Christ. Now there's one little, little phrase that the English versions have not caught. It's not caught in the NASV. It's not caught in the King James, the New King James, the Living Bible, the NIV, or the New English Bible. All ignore one phrase in this word. It is the word again. You don't find it in the translations. It is a prefix, ana, attached to the word meaning to head up. It's not there. In other words, it should read, it is summed up again. It is, let me read it again. Thus the summing up again of all things in Christ. That is missing in this, this translation. It means that it was once united, but it's not united now, but it will be united again. Something happened that caused everything to be spread apart, to be separated, to be disintegrated, and it has to be renewed. There was once harmony in heaven and earth, and God will have to bring back that harmony in Christ. God's purpose in Christ is to unite all things for himself under one head. Well, it tore everything apart. Go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. What tore everything apart? Genesis 3, 17 to 19. Then to Adam he said, it's right after they had sinned, because you have li listened to the voice of your wife <clears throat> and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. How? By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread 
till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Prior to this, he said also, the women will have trouble bearing children, right? And, and, and it will be painful, and it will be, as we have seen, half the world dies in infancy. And I reminded, I think it's on Wednesday night when we were going through this, that the fact that you can even raise a crop is the grace of God. I mean, every, the soil and everything is working against you so that it is with tremendous amount of work and sweat that you can raise a crop. Many people can't even do that. Look at all the areas of the world that no one can raise anything. All you have to do is go west of the Rocky Mountains to the west coast and you drive through mile and mile and mile of desert. We have a whole continent called Antarctica which nobody grows anything. We have the whole Sahara Desert and other deserts, the Gobi Desert. And where you can raise a crop, you have hail, wind, snow, insects, you name it. Now you say, oh, I'm glad I'm not a farmer. Well, we've got Murphy's Law. Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. We're living under a curse. And even our lives are under a curse. <clears throat> From dust you are until what? Dust you shall return. All of us are here for a moment. Last Sunday, Mer Merlin Stewart was here. And we all visited with him who were here. Today he's in glory. Amazing, isn't it? One minute you talk to him... And a couple hours later, he's talking to Jesus Christ. Wow. And we're all under that curse. I had a friend who's afraid he'd get cancer. Wouldn't put on deodorant. Wouldn't do all these things. Guess what he died of? Cancer. You can't avoid it. If it isn't cancer, it's your heart. If it's your, not your heart and cancer, it's something else. And if it's not heart, cancer, or something else, it could be an accident. You're not going to avoid it. I'm not going to avoid it. It is appointed unto man once to die. We're under a curse. And so God is going to restore what it was once again. He has to do that. That is why we have a millennial kingdom. That is why we have a kingdom so that the world can see what God intended for this world to be. Romans 8 tells us that even the creation groans. The rabbit that hops across your garden hops in fear. The bird that makes a nest is in fear. The grizzly bear is in fear. The polar bear is in fear. All the animals are out of tune, out of sync. The world's out of sync. And God in his grace is going to restore that again. And here's what he said. Things in the heavens and things on the earth in him. Paul is giving us God's plan for managing the universe. And this includes bringing all things together in the person of Christ, his sovereign rule and reign. And eventually it'll be the new heaven and new earth. Forever. The all things here is more than just believers. Things in heavens, plural, and the earth. God's plan for the universe will be fully accomplished through Christ. Not only did Christ's death bring us to those who believe eternal life, Christ, through Christ's death, the world will be reconciled to him. Look at Colossians 1.20. Take a look at that as our last verse this morning. Colossians 1.20. Ephesians, Philippians, 
and Colossians. Colossians 1.20. Verse 19, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, Christ, and through Him, Christ, to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or, or things in heaven. That's a day that is coming. That's a day that we can look forward to. And that's the thing that God has revealed to us in the fullness of time. Times. God will restore the world. What a, what a great thing for a hope for us. I listened to a program uh, yesterday, The Last Buffalo. Oh, that was discouraging. It was really discouraging. 23 buffalo were left in Yellowstone Park at one point. And animals are disappearing because of the curse. Won't it be great to see the day, and you and I will see it, when the lion will lie down with the calf, with the lamb, the bear and the cow will graze together, and there will be harmony in the universe, and people will be able to plant a garden in their backyard and feed themselves. That day's coming. And we're part of it. We ought to glorify God. And in this pessimistic world, we can offer hope to people. It's not going to end. You know, I mean, to tell you, people, this, this whole thing of climate change, it's got people scared and we're spending billions and billions of dollars when the Bible says summer and winter, day and night, cold and heat shall not cease as long as the earth remains. On the basis of the Word of God, I'm going to make a weather forecast. There will be spring. So be encouraged. This morning is our communion service. 